So I'm Shane Cannon. I'm also a member of the, the DAS group, and I'm also one of the uh, developers and maintainers of, of Shifter. So you, we've already heard a couple of references to it. Um, this will be a pretty kind of rapid walkthrough of it, um, but there's other resources at the end that I'll point you to that you can learn more about. Okay, so that's the uh, that's what we'll roll, run through. Just a quick intro to containers. We've already actually, with Tony's, we've kind of had one intro, so I'll probably be able to go through that a little bit quicker. Uh, roll of shifter, and then I'll just show it a little bit in action. Uh, Tony sort of went through this, but just in brief, what uh, sort of containers and Docker is sort of the poster child for container technologies allows you to do is it allows you to sort of build, ship, and run uh, kind of applications or tools or packages. Um, it provides uh, a set of tools to take uh, sort of a recipe and package that into an image, and then you can ship that to uh, a registry, either a, pri a public one like Docker, uh, it says Docker Cloud here, now it's Docker Hub, or, um, or a private one like the one that we run at NERSC, and then you can then pull those images down and, and run them on different hosts. So that could be on your laptop, a workstation, the cloud, or using Shifter, you can run it at NERSC. Roughly what is kind of packaged up in an image uh, is things like the file tree layout that you would see, uh, you know, imagine you log into a system, all of the, the directory tree structure that you see kind of gets captured. So that means the, the base operating system, base Linux operating system, all the libraries and tools that sort of come along with that, either from the OS itself, from the distribution, or that you might install. Uh, you know, your own user code and applications and even data. Um, and there's also ways to have it capture things like the environment variable settings, working directories, sort of default ways that it should execute. And then there are other things that aren't so much relevant to how we run these containers on HPC systems, but you can also have it capture things related to network settings uh, and the run user, for example. So um, Docker sounds really cool, and uh, some of you may have already used it, so why not? Why don't we just install Docker on the system and let users have at it. And the biggest reason is this first one, there's some just fundamental security issues with allowing a regular user to run Docker on, a, on an end system. And it effectively allows the user to have root privileges on that system. So this is an example where I'm going to just take slash and mount it into another uh, MNT space inside that container. And once I do that, I'm root and I could go and edit file. So if, if I was a regular end user that wasn't supposed to have any privileges, now I've got them. Or I could take somebody else's directory that I shouldn't have access to, map that in and start seeing their, their data, their files, be able to edit things. So obviously in a shared environment like, like NERSC, that's kind of a, a non-starter. There's other challenges around sort of how it integrates with the system um, that I won't dive in too deeply, but the main thing is, is we want this to sort of integrate within the batch system in a, in a clean way and we want this to be able to run it at scale. And so Docker out of the box sort of breaks a lot of these things. So to address that, uh, NERSC uh, a couple of years ago started an effort to, to figure out ways to be able to run sort of Docker containers securely and scalably on our systems. And the way we went about doing this is we wanted to leverage as much of the Docker ecosystem as possible. So all of the tools that you use to build the images and define them, we wanted to keep that the ways that you could uh, ship those images to registries, we wanted to keep that. But then we just wanted to replace the runtime component so that we could run those securely on our, on our systems. And so that's what, um, what this does. And uh, like I said, it's been in production for a couple of years now. And we were really on the forefront of this. NERSC was one of the first sites to really be pushing this, this model. So why or would you as an end user be uh, like containers and shifter? Um, so one thing is, is it means that you can develop a, you know, you can sort of test and develop an application on your workstation, package that up and, and ship it and run that exact same code on, uh, you know, Cori or Edison. Um, you're able to solve the dependency problems yourself. So if you've ever had a case where you went to go build something uh, at NERSC, and the first thing you ran into was like, oh, I need to install this library. 
And then you go to install that library and it says, oh, I need another set of libraries to build that library. And then you just spend you know, all afternoon sort of grabbing things, trying to get it to build. And then inevitably you hit something that just won't build easily. And then you, you know, it's a lot of yak shaving. So you can kind of bypass this all in a Docker container because you have total control over it. And you can just do an app get or a yum install instead of having to try to manually build all these things. You're not limited to the SUSE OS that we run on the, on the craze. You could run a Red Hat or a CentOS or Ubuntu or something like that. Um, in many cases, it improves application performance. Uh, Rollin showed a slide. I'll show, a, I'll show it again and talk about that. And also, these last two, in fact, I'll go to the next slide. I think containers are also useful just for science in general and for these, some of these reasons. One is it kind of helps with reproducibility. Because you can take everything you need to run that application, package it up, and save it and tag it up in a registry, that means later on you can pull it back down, rerun it, and know it's sort of the same code. You can also um, you know, have your uh, colleagues and uh, collaborators pull that image down and they can run the same thing as well. You could even publish it in a paper and then, you know, if somebody wants to go and test it out themselves, they've got everything they need to run that. Um, it also is, is a little more auditable than uh, what you might get. When you're using the Docker file format, which I'll talk about in a bit, it really has a clear set of steps of like, this is how I constructed this, right? This is how I built this environment. So if somebody wants to come back later on and look at it, they can, they don't have to know that there were all these un unwritten things that happen behind the scenes, they can look at that recipe and basically understand how you, uh, how you built things. Uh, portability, because you can now run that image across different systems. And uh, because of these things, you also get sort of some reduction in effort. I don't have to sit there and rebuild everything. I can just use the image that somebody else has already prepared for me. Okay, so what it looks like uh, in action. Uh, I don't think Tony showed any examples of a Docker file. This is just a very toy example just to show sort of the basic idea of what these things look like. So again, a Docker file is like a recipe on how you construct an image, right? So you could almost think about it as what are the things that you kind of copy into an environment and what are the things you run to start to prepare that, right? And that's effectively what these, the sort of primitives you see in these Docker files. So the first line, the from, is just saying, I want to take a base OS. I don't want, you don't want to, for everything, have to start from, from nothing. So there's a lot of common uh, OSs out there or, or base images that you typically use. So in this case, I'm, I'm basing it off an Ubuntu 14.04 image. This is kind of the old syntax, but it's always good habit to go ahead and put you know, who the person is that's creating this, uh, this Docker file. And then you see these two kind of primitives. There's run and add. So run is saying, you know, go into the matrix space, go into the container space, and run, you know, run this operation. So in this case, I'm just going to do an, I don't think that's a valid syntax. I think it should be app get update. Some of these I actually just typed in the window. I didn't cut and paste. So uh, you do an update, and then you, and, you know, install the build essential tools so that you've got GCC and stuff. And then add as a way to say, take something that from, is from outside the container I'm building and bring it into that space. So I'm saying, bring the working directory contents into slash my app. And then on the next step, I go in there and I, I start to build it. So that's just a very simple example. You can imagine, you can just keep kind of chaining these things to do more complicated operations. And then the other thing is, is at the end, what happens is to create, take this recipe and create an image from it. These are the commands I would run. So I'd say docker build, and I'd give it a name, and then there's a little period there at the end that's easy to overlook that says use the current working directory as the place to look for the docker file. And then once it's built, I can push it to a registry like that. Um, there's a kind of a missing step here, which is you have to, the first time you've used docker and you're, you want to push something, you have to log in and give it its, your credentials for the registry that you're going to push to. But once you've done that, you can always just um, push again later on without uh, authenticating. So the other thing that's interesting here is, you know, now I've got this tagged image. Others could, base off of that, use instead of their from line saying Ubuntu, they could say this and then add things to it too. So 
You can also imagine creating sort of a, a you know, a base image that you might use for a larger project, and then you could have sub images off of that that have you know specific tweaks to it, for example. Uh, and there's also a colon and a number there. You can create tags as well. So that means that's a good way to say if you kind of get something that's working well, you could put a specific tag on it so that you could go back and reuse it later. All right. And then uh, so in here we've prepared an image and we pushed it to a registry. How would we use that with Shifter? So um, you can uh, use uh, Shifter to run images sort of interactively or through a batch, uh, a batch script. So in this case, I'm showing the batch, batch mode. So we have extensions to Slurm to sort of understand, to know about Shifter. So you can actually embed this, um, this dash dash image to tell it what Shifter image you, uh, what Docker image you want to use. And that'll make sort of behind the scenes, it'll do some setup for you. So that later on when you do, uh, in this example, we're doing an MPI application. So we, the only thing that's different is we just add this shifter command in before the execution of the actual application. And in this case, that application exists in the image inside that uh, container. It doesn't exist in, you know, if I went out on Cori and looked, there's no slash my app directory. This is coming from the image. Um, I could also start up an interactive session and just uh, get out on a node and type shifter and dash dash image and whatever image I want to run and use that as well. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, not too bad. So uh, one question people have asked is, can you use shifter and containers and run MP applications? And the short, the brief answer is yes. We have support that's sort of built in to help you do this, and uh, I give an example of sort of a of, of building an image with MPI support in it. Uh, under the hood, what we do is we kind of map in the, the libraries that are optimized for the Cray behind the scenes. So the, the only thing you really need to do is you build it with uh, like a, a relatively new version of mPitch, and uh, behind the scenes we'll bring in these the right libraries, and uh, you'll get, as a result, you'll get native performance. So this is an example. Here we're using a base image that we've already uh, constructed. Uh, and then we just add in our application. We build it just like we normally would. So there's nothing that looks specific, you know, particularly different. And then when we go to run the application, we just, uh, again, just would do the S run. The S runs outside of the container space. And then you do shifter in the application. So. Um, and if you were to look at the Docker file for that Ubuntu, this uh, base image here, all you would see is we just took Ubuntu, we just downloaded um, uh, mpitch and built it. There's nothing particularly uh, special about it. Uh, Roland showed a, a version of this. Originally when we developed Shifter, it was, it was really geared around kind of productivity, making it easier for people to get applications running on the, on the systems. But we also realized there was some performance benefits as well. And so by, by the fact that you package that all up into um, this one image that we then kind of mount up into the file system space of the compute node, uh, you, a lot of the metadata access and things like that don't have to go all the way back to the Lustre file systems metadata servers. Instead, it's, it's kind of handled locally. And so as a result, we can get a lot of, uh, we can get speed ups in things like Python. So anything that's doing a lot of dynamic library loading, you may want, if you're going to run this at really large scales, you might want to consider uh, putting that in a shifter container. Just a few notes about the differences be between shifter behavior versus Docker. Uh, the biggest thing is processes run as you, not as root. Uh, this is for obvious sort of security reasons. Uh, also, images are mounted up read only. So if you have an image and it's its behavior is to go and edit files inside the image at runtime, that will probably not work with Shifter. There's ways to work around it, but that one is probably the more tedious one. For the first one, you just need to make sure that any of the you know, executables or libraries that you need to access, uh, that they're world readable and not just readable by, by root. Um, 
We also automatically mount in home directories and scratch directories, project, things like that. So there's a lot of sort of magic that just happens for you. Um, and there are certain directives that we don't support in Docker, but generally if you just want to package your application up, uh, it should work. Uh, there are some other things that probably don't have time to go into any depth, but you can do things like volume mounts. This allows you to take a directory tree sort of outside the container space and map it into a location in the container space. So, for example, you could take your scratch area and have it show up as slash data, for example, in the container space. So you have some flexibility about where things appear inside the, inside the container. There's something called a per node uh, per node write cache or writable scratch space where you can take, uh, there are a lot of cases where people need something that looks like a local disk, but we don't have that on the craze. And so this is a way to kind of emulate that behavior. Um, it's particularly good for things like, we've used it for example with Spark where it wants to write to a local scratch area and we'd see a lot of performance degradation if we just used uh, Luster for that. Uh, also, um, Tony talked about the spin uh, registry. We also have a registry that's really intended for people running things through Shifter uh, that you can push images to. You, just, uh, you can just log into that using your, your regular NERSC uh, LDAP password and account. Uh, just quickly, since Tony talked about uh, spin, just wanted to say, so Shifter, you generally will use Shifter if you want to run things on the HPC systems at scale if you want to run modeling simulation jobs, analysis, you know, machine learning tools, things like that. Um, you know, things that have a sort of a finite lifetime to them when you run. And you typically would use spend for things like persistent services, um, things that you want to run kind of indefinitely, uh, things that need to be externally accessible. Uh, and you know, the difference in sort of how they run is this is using, spend's using regular stock Docker. Shifter is sort of a modified runtime. And just briefly, an example of how some users have used Shifter. Uh, this comes from an application called Toast. Uh, and here they ran at the pretty much the full scale of the KNL side of Cori. Uh, so some 50,000, 50, I think, do you remember what scale they ran at? 600,000, uh, yeah, yeah, 600,000 cores, yeah, it's full of the machine. And uh, for them, it was really critical that they used Shifter because originally they tried just running it. It's a Python sort of wrapper around their application. And when they tried running at, a, you know, above a certain scale, they were spending all of their time just in startup trying to load in the Python application. So, but you know, this was kind of critical to their success. Uh, and getting these runs to, to go through. Uh, so you can run at the full, full system size. And if you need more information on the NERSC website, under four users software, there's a shifter section and it covers most of what I just talked about. There's also, we've given, uh, Lisa Gerhardt and I have given tutorials at SC and some other venues and uh, there's a link to the material for that. Uh, in our GitHub area under Shifter Tutorial. So if you just go to the NERSC uh, GitHub area, you'll see it. And then obviously for Docker itself, there's lots of resources out there. So just Google it is probably the best, the best way to go. Um, I don't think I really have any time for any demos, so I'll just, uh, I can take questions. So. How many people have used Docker? Okay, you guys don't count. <laughs> okay, huh. Okay, well, I definitely say, even if you're not sure if you have an immediate use for it, grab it, install it on your laptop, and kick the tires on it. It's really pretty powerful. It's even useful just as a way on your laptop if you want a quick way to get into a Linux environment so you have access to other tools. Even just for that, it's worthwhile. But I think once you get used to it, you'll see uh, you know, the, the full value of it.